Network layer security. Every blockchain we're aware of, at least the permissionless ones, use some sort of data transmission network, like a peer-to-peer -peer network in, in most cases, in some cases additional private peering agreements among, among uh, nodes. And as such, it's really important that every peer is kind of up to date with the data that's being distributed in this, in this uh, permissionless network. So in this segment of the lecture, we'll be looking at network layer security and uh, what are the different things that potentially could go wrong, right? Naturally, this is not an exhaustive list of all the possible network layer attacks, but it should give you a good icebreaker on what's possible there. So if you look at the network layer, we might ask, so why, why does the network layer matter? Well, we have all the information, like the information about blocks and transactions and even peers, it's being disseminated over the network layer. And uh, this dissemination and propagation um, is happening in an asynchronous manner. And asynchronous meaning that not all the nodes receive all the information at the same time, and there's also often no guarantee on the bound, um, on the time delay at which uh, a particular node receives data. If the network propagation is based on IP, the internet protocol, then the data transmission is really just the best efforts protocol. So there's no guarantee that your packet arrives even. So that's why we often use something like TCP so that you have data packet retransmission um, in order to guarantee that there's a, the, the recipient actually receives some data. In some cases, uh, we might have UDP um, if the um, if, the, um, if there's a, a need for a quick burst of transmission. And in general, there are also more recent internet protocols like QUIC that might be applicable. So I really would like to encourage you to, to check basically what the latest blockchain protocols are proposing and whether there might be improvements that can be done, which may, may be a nice research project. So naturally latency matters. So latency among the peers is really crucial. So if you have a, a rather larger network, like thousands of nodes, uh, then the latency among those peers matter. So if you're having here one node that's then transmitting a transaction to another node, and this which is connected to a third, or then maybe a fourth node. So the latency, the transmission latency at every hop here uh, really does matter, right? So you want these latencies to be maybe on the order of 50 milliseconds or lower. Um, but sometimes, for example, between Europe and Australia, there might be latencies beyond 200 milliseconds, which naturally then will delay the propagation of this very transaction. Right? So there's an inherent propagation delay from the originator to, uh, let's say, the last recipient of the transaction. Now you might ask, well, how many nodes are there really in these um, networks? Well, if you look at Bitcoin, uh, there's a beautiful website called um, BitNodes, uh, where you can see a, a geographical uh, distribution of the, of the IP addresses of the full reachable nodes. When I say reachable, I mean nodes that have exposed the TCP port 8333. This is the default Bitcoin peer-to-peer um, -peer, uh, port. And uh, there are about 100,000. So this does fluctuate, right? Because it's permissionless, you can just spin up your node or shut it down whenever you want. But um, over the years, over the last, uh, I'd say, uh, four, four, five years, it's been actually quite consistent at about uh, 10,000 nodes. So these are naturally just the reachable nodes. Reachable meaning, as I said, right, they, they have an open port. Um, it's highly likely, so if this is, for example, here, a reachable node, that there's maybe a light client. So let's, let's assume this is here a mobile phone. Um, so there are light clients with mobile phones, for example, that may connect to this full node. And these light clients, they obviously, they don't, they don't expose any port, right? They don't service other nodes. Um, so it's really just here, these full reachable nodes that have a full copy of the blockchain, by the way. Um, so we call them full nodes. And these, these, um, these nodes um, are responsible to serving kind of like a deeper network of, of uh, for example, SPV clients, simple payment verification clients. Now the, um, the, the tricky part is we don't really know how many of these, uh, let's say, lightweight clients there are. And obviously there can also be full nodes that are not exposing their IP. They can still be connected here to, to these different nodes, but let's, 
let's assume I draw them here like in a in a shallow circle. So let's assume this these are here nodes, they're connected somehow in this graph, maybe like this. Um, so and they are not exposing uh, any any TCP port, right? So so no open port. And for these nodes, we 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 can um, we can infer that there are some techniques actually that that may infer that there are these nodes. Um, uh, there's, for example, a, a paper called TX Probe that I can recommend you to read, which is quite uh, quite cool. And it's a cool technique to also infer the topology, like which node is connected to which node, right? Um, so there's a lot of work basically on the network layer of identifying who's connected to who, etc. But what we know is, well, a uh, long, long talk, uh, short conclusion. We, we just know like there are these number of, of uh, publicly reachable nodes that you can look at. So I leave it uh, to you as an exercise to check out the number of public, uh, publicly reachable nodes, for example, for Ethereum or your favorite blockchain, um, such as Dogecoin or whatever, um, uh, to, to see what's your uh, number of full nodes. Notice that this number of full nodes doesn't really imply anything on the sense of decentralization. Um, it's, it's not really, th these nodes are not doing any mining or not necessarily doing any mining. So it doesn't, doesn't immediately affect the security of the network, but obviously uh, there shouldn't be just like three, right? So, um, well, three being just a magic number, um, which doesn't mean anything uh, per se, but you, I hope you, you understand what I mean. You want this number to be reasonably high, that there is enough redundancy. Um, but now whether we have 10,000 or 20,000, um, I'm not sure it does make a big difference on the on the decentralization of the network. There are likely other factors that are more crucial. So I already answered the this question here to some degree. So we do have these full nodes, right? These are full nodes that, that uh, host basically the entirety of the blockchain and the light nodes that might, for example, just host the um, chain of headers, just the, the block headers while omitting the transaction content. Uh, a header in Bitcoin is about um, 80 bytes in size. Uh, so that's a rather small amount times the number of blocks. And you can calculate how, how big that would be. And then in order to verify whether a transaction is included in a block, you can run the SPV protocol that we discussed earlier in the lecture uh, to verify whether there's a, a transaction actually in the block. And so these light nodes here often communicate with the full nodes and they're really dependent on them, right? So they, you have uh, the light nodes, depending on your client, connecting to between five to 10 uh, full nodes and uh, requesting data from those. So you might ask now, good, okay, I got a high level understanding of what this network looks like, but what, how, do, how do transactions propagate? Well, let's assume here we have this world map uh, of just like two miners and a few nodes, a few full nodes. Let's, let's just if you assume we have full nodes, so no lightweight clients here in this particular figure. Um, and we have a trader, he uh, issues a transaction and he's willing to pay a transaction fee of five. So for the time being, we ignore what value that five represents or what unit this is. It's just like an, uh, an absolute number five here. So then this transaction propagates because it somehow propagates to one of those miners. And this miner um, has an internal queue. So it's called the mempool or memory pool. Uh, it's basically a term stemming from Bitcoin and other blockchains adopted that one, um, where you have the list of unconfirmed transactions. Unconfirmed meaning this trans transaction was not yet mined in a block, right? So you do have uh, for example, here already two transactions in this memory pool. One is paying a, a fee of one, the other one is paying a fee of 10. So if we add this, this third transaction, right, then the order in the final block that the miner would be mining could be the following, right? So the transaction that gets executed first is the one that pays the highest fee. So the execution order here would be then along this uh, basically in this in this direction, right? So you have here transaction number one, which pays 10 fees, transaction number two, which pays five, and transaction three, which pays a uh, transaction fee of one only, right? So this is, um, we, we've looked actually at the Ethereum blockchain uh, a few months back, and this is 
rough back then roughly um, uh, what 80% of the miners were adhering to, right? This is the transaction fee order, or transaction gas fee order. Um, there, there are naturally other agreements, private agreements, other ways to pay miners um, that are uh, where miners have become and the community has become really uh, creative recently, which is which is amazing to see. But um, in in essence, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's likely always the transaction that pays or rewards the miners the most will have the highest chance of being executed first. So what does that mean? Well, from a security perspective, because this is the security lecture, we have to look at here uh, an attacker. So what could an attacker do given this knowledge, right? Well, the attacker could create a so-called spy node, um, meaning a node that's connected to um, as many peers as possible, um, being um, here these full nodes, as well as miners, if, if the attacker can identify the IP addresses of the miners and nodes of the miners, net, obviously. But the, the attacker can really try to connect to every node. Right? And we have seen dedicated clients doing that. So things they do is basically optimizing the internet connectivity in terms of uh, the, the, the latency, in terms of the upload and download bandwidth, in terms of the uh, co-location to miners. So it might not even be only one physical spy node, but several physical spy nodes. For example, what we've seen is that the uh, AWS networks are a really like popular place to host, for example, um, Ethereum nodes. Um, and naturally, if you as an adversary, you're being co-located in the AWS data center and you're connecting to the nodes in that data center, you will have the quickest connectivity to those, right? So the at attacker will certainly need to uh, deploy basically several um, high frequency peers, uh, spy nodes, if you will, in the uh, globally to, to have a complete picture of what's going on on the on the network. This is just a network layer, right? We, we are not yet at the at the at the blockchain layer where data is actually written into the blocks. All right, so given this knowledge now, so let's assume we have here an adversary with a spy node. And naturally, because the adversary is so well connected, he will receive or he will uh, get notice of this transaction that's being sent with a transaction fee of five. Now, um, we have earlier discussed uh, that we have here a mempool, right? The pool of unconfirmed transactions uh, of the miner. And what the adversary can do, because the adversary has a direct connection to the miner, so he can actually probably speed up the uh, propagation of the victim transaction here of the of the five of the blue uh, of the of the blue transaction with transa uh, transaction fees five by uh, simply um, creating a transaction that pays like uh, one um, one element more of transaction fees, and the adversary can even like ship uh, the victim transaction uh, to the miner. So, uh, I mean, why would he ship the victim transaction as well? Well, it could be that the victim transaction is being stuck somewhere, but it's important for the adversary that the victim transaction remains close to the, uh, to the adversarial transaction, here the red one. Right? So let's assume these two packets beautifully arrive at the miner, and then what you see here is this order, right? So you see, all right, so there's a transaction fee 10, uh, 6, 5, and 1. So the order, the execution order will be the following, and we just said that this here is the adversarial transaction, right? And this here is the victim. So we can see here that the adversary is front running the victim, right? Front running in the sense of um, attempting to be executed before the victim, while um, while uh, basically acting on on the information that this victim transaction is propagating in the network. So. There are different definitions of front running, uh, which may also have different legal implications. Uh, I guess I'm not uh, I'm not an expert in that field, um, but the um, the SEC, for instance, defines front running as an act of uh, operating on private information in, in many cases, uh, as as far as I've understood. So here you might say, well. Um, the knowledge that there's a victim transaction propagating isn't really like private knowledge, right? I mean, this is a public peer-to-peer -peer network. Everybody can connect to it. Um, 
So some might argue that this is maybe not a definition of front running according some according to some legal understanding, but um, I'll leave this to the to the regulators and lawyer to fully understand and 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 capture. Um, and I uh, just want to show you here that there's certainly the possibility of replay of, of, of altering the order at which transactions are executed on chain, which has a significant impact on DeFi um, in, 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 as we will uh, see in, in later sections and specifically when we speak about um, sandwich attacks. So front running is really like an important uh, property. I can recommend you uh, check out the paper Flash Boys, um, Flash Boys 2.0. So uh, Flash Boys was a high frequency trading book uh, many years back, and Flash Boys 2.0 is kind of um, the um, it's it's kind of the first paper that discusses uh, one of the first papers that discusses front running um, in the in the public permissionless P2P networks of blockchains. Similarly, we have front running, but we do have back running, right? Back running is basically the same process as front running. However, the adversary tries to uh, to, to be executed right after the victim. Um, so, for example, if there's a price oracle update, and you want to be ex you want your transaction to be executed right after the price oracle update, you might back run the price oracle update, right? Because you you are aware that there will be a state change upon the successful completion and execution of the oracle transaction. And hence, you can uh, immediately, for example, liquidate um, uh, a, a lending position. So um, the process is again the same, right? So here there's a victim, uh, issues a transaction with transaction fee 5. The adversary visualizes or finds this, this victim transaction. Let's say it's a price oracle update. Then the adversary will issue an adversarial transaction uh, paying the same gas fee or same fee uh, depending on your chain, obviously, so same fee. And um, then what matters here is the order at which uh, these two transactions arrive in the mempool of the miner. So if the victim, uh, if the adversary makes sure that the victim transaction is sent first and then the adversarial transaction is, is sent to the miner, in that case, uh, as far as I have understood, Geth is currently ordering transactions in the following way. So for transactions that pay the same gas um, fee in, in Ethereum, the, the one that is received first gets executed first. Right? So you could obviously also pay a, a fee of four uh, if you'd like to. However, if there's another transaction that pays five and arrives later, it might get executed before. Um, before your backrunning transaction, which you maybe don't want to. So in a sense, in a sense the order of transaction execution is again the following. And here we have this time the victim first and then the adversary transaction afterwards. So yeah, as I mentioned here, this can be a liquidation um, while the adversary transaction, uh, the victim transaction can be an oracle price update, for instance, right? Because based on this price oracle update, you can infer, well, I know that this debt position will be liquidated after the execution of this uh, price oracle update. Hence, I want to be the first liquidator and grab the liquidation profit. So you've seen, right? I mean, there's so many things going on on the network layer. You have can front run, you can back run transactions. You have to consider with which nodes you peer with, with which nodes you do not peer with, maybe even uh, how to co-locate and which data center to co-locate. Um, how do you manage your TCP connections? I mean, uh, think think of uh, setting up like 10,000 of TCP connections. You probably need to increase the file descriptor size on your Linux machine. So there are really like a lot of network layer security aspects that uh, you need to consider when uh, doing front running or back running or in, in general blockchain security. Uh, so very exciting.